Gardening information is encyclopedic by nature. There's more information out there about growing a garden than one person can possibly ever know in a lifetime. Sifting through this ocean of information is both daunting and time consuming. Enter the Garden Quickie, a series of hyper-focused gardening tutorials diving deep into a singular but focused topic. Hard to believe that we've done 20 of them already. Time truly does go quick. Here's a compilation of episodes 11 to 20. The first sign of problems in a plant usually shows up in the foliage. These guys here are super healthy, however, these guys here, as well as these guys, have some issues. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the most pressing garden issues of the day. And today is all about the tomato leaf curl. Tomato leaf curl is exactly what the name suggests and is when the leaves of some or all of the tomato plant curl up and inwards. There's three main reasons why this happens, and we're gonna cover all three. The first and most likely cause is physiological. That is, it's a response by the plant to an environmental stimuli that it doesn't like. Usually, this would be excessive heat and or drought. In this case, the tomato plant is literally curling its leaves to reduce the surface area to conserve as much fluids as possible. And while the damage is not irreversible or life-threatening to the plant, or even contagious for that matter, intermittent drought and temperature stress like this will take its toll. It may affect your fruiting productivity, and in severe cases, even lead to blossom end rot. Fix the stress sooner than later by watering more, mulching, and in extreme cases, even moving the plant or possibly erecting shade cloth. The second cause for leaf curl would be herbicide or pesticide drift. Not nearly as common, but if you had a neighbor spray or maybe the city or municipality on a windy day, a portion of that spray could end up on your plants, causing the leaf curl. It's not very common, but there's also not much you can do about it, other than maybe asking your neighbors to be very careful when they're broadcasting their poisons. And lastly, we have the most damaging cause of leaf curl and one where you have to actually dispose of the entire plant, which thankfully is not affecting this tiny Tim, and that's the tomato leaf curl virus. If your tomato plant's foliar issues are not solved by dealing with that environmental stress, you could be dealing with disease. The best way to test for this is to water thoroughly the night before and check the leaves the next morning. If they're still curled, misshapen, or starting to get spots, the plant must be removed from your garden. Now, don't compost it, truly. You have to burn the plant or throw it away. All right, guys, if you do happen to get tomato leaf curl this year, I do hope it's because your plants are thirsty and that it's hot out. I also hope that you check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Zucchinis. Big plants with an even bigger harvest. Summer squash is a crop where you only need a couple of plants to feed an entire army. Provided it's grown right. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we tackle the most relevant growing issues of the day. And if you haven't already guessed it, today we're talking about maxing out our zucchini harvests. Yikes. I've got five ways to prevent plants like this there's no time for nonsense, so let's dive right in. Tip number one to max out your zucchinis this year is spacing. You need to give these large plants enough space, at least 12 to 18 inches apart. And there's two main reasons for this. One, you don't want these large vigorous plants competing for water or nutrients. They'll suffer and so will your yields. And two, when the plants, specifically the foliage, is too close together, Airflow is restricted, and now you've just invited pests and disease. Give them space. Tip number two is to water properly. Zucchini plants that are top watered frequently will often develop shallow root systems, creating a much weaker plant that's unable to handle periods of heat and or drought. Water less often, but when you do, really give the plants a good soaking.
Tip number three is nutrients. Zucchinis are large, impressive plants. Yes, a lot of their composition is water, but they're heavy, heavy feeders. Start your young zucchini plants off in a quality soil or potting mix to begin with, and then amend with a balanced liquid food soon after. And finally, top it off again with each successive round of flowering. This is also gonna help with successive harvest and keep your zucchini plants producing and producing and producing. Tip number four is pollination. Zucchini plants have both male and female flowers and can self-pollinate, but they're very, very clumsy at it. And on top of that, they often don't flower at the same time. We can help them along by simply exposing the male anthers and rubbing them on the ends of the female pistil. And who said gardening wasn't fun? And lastly, if that wasn't fun enough, the more you pick, the more you get. I know that sounds like an obvious statement, but what I mean is zucchini plants tend to produce and replace fruit as it gets harvested. And they do this at an astonishing rate. So the more you pick, the more that plant will produce. Zucchinis are picked immature, so the plant keeps getting triggered to producing more and more. Amazing. My hope for you is that by employing these five tips, you're gonna have your best zucchini year ever. My hope for me is you'll be sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Carrots are one of the last remaining crops that I still direct sow. And you kind of have to because, well, they're carrots. That's how they're grown. The issue is, with something as small and numerous as carrot seeds, eventually in the crop's life cycle, it'll have to be thinned. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we discuss the top growing questions of the day. And today, it's all about thinning your carrots. Over the years, I've found that there's three main ways to do this. We don't got much time, so let's get into it. The first way to thin your carrots is to simply plant them thinned. That is, when you're first sowing your carrot seeds, space the seeds accordingly. That way, when the carrots grow up, they don't need any thinning maintenance at all. While this seems like a no-brainer and sort of a why don't we always do it this way kind of situation, you have to realize that the germination rates of carrot seeds are never 100%. Even 100% viable batches of seeds have a shelf life, and carrots are notoriously the worst at longevity. So you could end up with sparse patches of carrots, missing out on nearly the entire crop as a result. Because of this, carrots are almost always overseeded. The second method is to simply manually thin the carrots when they reach about three to four inches tall. This is done by height rather than age because there's many variables that go into the speed of a carrot's growth. Simply pull up the smallest, weakest plants so that your spacing ends up with roughly one inch between each carrot plant. Depending on your variety and its natural size, you may need to thin again around a month later or so to about two inches apart. At any time, the pulled baby carrots are completely edible. Dang. <laughs> the final way that I thin my carrots and my preferred method is to simply pull out the biggest ones once the carrots reach about a month or so of age. This way, you're constantly eating a supply of fresh baby carrots while simultaneously thinning the carrot patch. Zero wastage and an ongoing fresh supply of delicious baby carrots. To me, this is much more preferable than an all at once harvest that needs to be stored and or preserved. Carrots are a super versatile root crop with multiple planting windows throughout the year. Combine that with an extended stretched out harvest and you could be enjoying fresh carrots nearly all year. Know what else you can enjoy all year? Garden quickies. Hope to see you in the next one. Lettuce. Even if you employ the cut and come again method, it unfortunately doesn't grow and last forever. Environmental clues in the form of heat and light put a time limit on a lettuce plant's lifespan from the moment it germinates. 
But from this last attempt at a survival strategy arises the possibility of new life and a really, really good garden video. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we cover the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about saving your own lettuce seeds. Through watering, shading, selective harvesting, whatever, lettuce is one of those crops where we try to avoid the flowering stage. As we tend to just harvest the leaves, the act of the plant flowering or bolting signals the end of the harvest. Bolting starts as a tendency to send everything vertical. Leaves become smaller, tougher, and way less tasty, and will start to aim upwards, both in orientation and growing up the stem. And it's from that center stem that comes the flower structure, and it's unmistakable. In mid to late summer, lettuce will do this all on its own. There's nothing we need to do other than provide the bare minimum water so that it can complete this function. The real key in saving lettuce seeds comes in the timing. Even though they come up and appear fast, lettuce seeds take a surprisingly long time to mature. You may be tempted to cut the flower buds off once the actual flowers wither away, but you gotta wait. This is still too soon. The perfect timing for collecting the lettuce seeds happens when you begin to see little white tufts of fluff appearing. The seeds are actually directly attached to this papoose, as it's known botanically, as this is its dispersal mechanism. The lettuce plant wants these modified florets to catch the wind and fly away the seeds to greener pastures. Pretty amazing. But for us, this is the sign that it's time to collect the seeds. Too early, and the seeds won't be mature. And too late, your seeds are just gonna fly away. Each tiny flower should contain about 15 to 20 relatively small seeds. So getting enough for the rest of planting either this year or next is pretty easy. There's two ways that I like to collect the seeds, depending on how mature the seed heads are. If the seed heads are relatively young, you can simply pluck off the florette tufts and hope the seeds stay attached. The tufts are crazy light, so they're pretty easy to separate from the seeds. The other way is if the seed heads are a bit more mature and maybe already starting to fly away, is to bend the entire cluster of heads into a bucket and shake. If ready, the seeds will fall en masse into your bucket for easy collection. Store the seeds in a cool, dark, dry location. Lettuce seeds have some of the longest shelf lives, usually up to six years. Growing your own lettuce is awesome. And saving your seeds is next level. Know what else is awesome and next level? Checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. With summer in full swing and our gardens producing like crazy, there's no better time to be a gardener. Forward thinking growers, however, are keenly aware that fall is looming and the clock is ticking for all remaining unripened fruit. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the most important growing questions of the day. And today, it's all about ripening your peppers. The fruits of almost all varieties of peppers start out their life green, eventually turning a shade of yellow, red, orange, purple, brown, or even black. Each variety does this at slightly different speeds, but they all have one thing in common. Once the nighttime low temperatures hit around 55 Fahrenheit or 12 degrees Celsius, the ripening of the fruit of the plant comes to a massive slowdown if not a complete halt. Of course, peppers can not only be eaten green, as well as picked green and then ripened off to indoors quite easily. But if you're like me and you're always looking for that ripe off the plant experience, I got three ways to speed the ripening process up before the days of fall are upon us. Method number one is easy, and that's the harvest. Like most fruiting plants, the more you harvest, the more you get. And peppers, like most fruiting plants, put a ton of energy into their fruit. By removing large fruit as they ripen, or close to it, the remaining peppers in turn will ripen faster as the plant has more energy to spare and to divide amongst the fruit that's still attached. Oh. 
The second way to ripen your peppers faster is to shelter them. You see, peppers, and really most commercial nightshades, such as tomatoes and eggplants, ripen due to the presence of a gas called ethylene. The plants emit this odorless, tasteless gas themselves, and it's the catalyst that starts a cascade of reactions and processes to start the ripening sequence. In windy areas, this gas can be easily lost and dispersed, causing a delay in the ripening process. It's partially the reason why greenhouse peppers ripen so much faster than those of the same age outdoors. Reduce the airflow and watch the ripening rate increase significantly. And the final way that I hasten the ripening process of all my peppers is to cut off all remaining flowers when I'm about eight weeks away from my first fall frost date. Not only will those flowers not produce viable fruit anyway in that short window of time, they're also a drain on the plant as a whole, taking valuable energy away from existing fruit. Cut the flowers off and give your fruit a chance to not only reach its full potential, but to do so even faster. If you're anxious about your peppers not being finished in time for winter, hasten the ripening process in these three ways for maximum effect. And in a pinch, remember that they can always be ripened indoors if need be. Know what else is good in a pinch? The Garden Quickie. Hope to see you in the next one. If you're like me, it's mid-season and your pepper plants are busting out like crazy. The midsummer bounty with these guys is flourishing and it feels unlimited. If that's not the case, however, don't get down. I've got you covered. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another exciting episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we tackle the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about the mid-season pepper boost. I got five ways that I like to boost my pepper plants mid-season to max out the potential of each plant. We've only got about 90 seconds left, so let's get to it. The first way that I make sure my pepper plants are thriving is to water the right way. Deep thorough watering, ensuring that the plants are creating deep stretching taproot systems for drought resistance and stronger plants. Don't let the foliage flag or wilt, but you don't want to be watering daily either. Remember, every time you water, you're flushing the soil of valuable nutrients, especially in container peppers. Oof, look at that guy. Hey, speaking of nutrients, to really get the most of a heavy producing plant like peppers, they're going to need a supplemental boost. It doesn't need to be a hardcore chemical synthetic fertilizer, but to really get your pepper plants to shine, they're going to need something. At this stage, I'm more concerned with flowers and fruit than I am with foliage. Therefore, I pick a liquid organic feed that's light on nitrogen, or even better, I make my own from seaweed or just use some extra compost. Whatever you choose, the mid-season boost of nutrients is pretty much essential to maxing out a pepper plant's yield. Another problem I often see is pollination issues. If a pepper's flower isn't pollinated, there'll be no fruit, period. And as the leaves of the pepper are not edible, a non-fruiting pepper plant is a waste of resources. Fortunately, pepper plants have what's known as complete flowers, meaning they're not only self-pollinating, but they self-pollinate on the same flower. However, if you're still having pollination issues, simply take a Q-tip or a small paintbrush and gently swab a few flowers in succession to spread the pollen. If you do have to manually spread the pollen, do it in the late afternoon, as that's when pollen is at its peak production. Sticking with the flowers, tip number four is to pinch off all remaining flower buds when there's less than 40 days left to your first fall frost. Any flower buds that haven't set fruit by now are too late to the party. Nip them off now as they're a drain on the plant, unnecessarily using up resources. And the last tip to max out your peppers mid-season is to simply harvest. Like most fruiting plants, the more you harvest, the more they produce. Picking off the fruit signals to the plant to produce more. How great is that? And being able to ripen the peppers off the plant means that you can double or triple harvest these guys, no problem. Pepper plants are so prolific, sometimes it's astounding. Know what else is astounding? Hopefully you checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie.
Right now, we're in the long days of summer, and ideally, your pepper bounty is all that you hoped it would be. <laughs> I know mine is, and as a fan of green peppers, I'm literally swimming in them. But not everyone likes the more pungent taste of an unripe pepper. I get that. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about ripening peppers off the plant. Most peppers start out green. In fact, a green pepper, hot or sweet, is simply an unripe colored pepper. And this is precisely the reason why green peppers are cheaper at the store than the red, yellow, or orange ones. The color change of the mature pepper happens naturally and normally on the plant, and it's quite dramatic. And it's also rather quick once it gets going. Yeah, once it gets going. If it gets going. Being a perennial plant, peppers will keep producing right up to that first frost. And you could be left with a massive amount of green peppers still on the plant with an impending fall with zero chance of them ripening in time. So what can you do? Well, if you're like me, you can simply harvest them and eat them green. Why do they have to be red or any of the other colors anyway? The answer is they don't. You know, green is just fine. It's completely edible. But some people do like the taste of red peppers better, and they're most certainly sweeter than those that are green. But in addition to flavor, research has been done on the nutrition of unripe peppers versus those that are ripened, and the discrepancies are staggering. A simple red pepper was found to have significantly higher nutrition content in things like vitamin C, vitamin A, folates, and beta carotenes. No question for maximum nutrition, we should be eating ripe peppers. Okay then, so can we take the unripe green peppers off the plant and then ripen them indoors like we do tomatoes? Well, sort of. Peppers do ripen off the vine, especially if they've already started the ripening process while still attached to the plant. But new research has suggested that the main compound responsible for tomatoes ripening, ethylene gas, has little to no effect on peppers. So while a box of green tomatoes can ripen and turn red in the presence of a banana or even another ripe tomato, the same isn't true for peppers, unfortunately. The only thing that works is time. A sunny windowsill is often suggested, but be careful. Too hot for too long, and just like peppers on the plant, they can burn and be ruined. Honestly, the best solution is in a dry, warm location indoors, away from excessive direct sunlight. Open air, indirect light, and room temperatures, or slightly higher, that's the secret. And that's really the only way to do it. And how does the nutrient content of these ones ripen indoors compare to those ripened on the plant? Well, that's a good question. Know what else is a good question? The one we're gonna answer in the next episode of The Garden Quickie. As our gardens flourish and fruit, bloom and provide, our thoughts often turn from thanks and gratitude to how can I get even more? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we find the solutions to your garden questions. And today is all about saving pepper seeds. Easily one of the top backyard crops, I get asked whether or not we can save our pepper seeds more times than I can count. The short answer is yes, you can most definitely save your pepper seeds. The long answer, well, there's four things to consider whenever you're pepper seed saving. Time's ticking, so let's get to it. The first thing you want to make sure of whenever you're saving pepper seeds is to use heirloom varieties. Crosses or store-bought peppers are hybrids, often with unknown parentage and thus unknown fruit. In a four month plus endeavor to successfully grow pepper plants, don't waste your time on unknowns. On that same vein, if you're aiming to save pepper seeds this year, don't grow different varieties close together. Peppers have what's known as perfectly complete flowers, meaning both male and female parts reside on a single flower. And this is why we consider them self-pollinators. But all too often, peppers are clumsy at it. 
and certainly not what I would call monogamous. Different varieties should be grown at least 90 meters apart, or pick ones that flower at different times. Cross-pollination is a big one, don't overlook it. Okay, now that you know your source peppers are free of cross-pollination, free of contaminants, you're gonna wanna choose the best specimens. Pick the peppers from not only the healthiest plants, but also from the fruit that displays the best characteristics of that variety. If you wanna grow the best, you gotta start with the best. Lastly, and this is super important, make sure to collect the seeds from vine ripened peppers only. Peppers set viable seed really late, so you wanna ensure that each seed pod is fully mature. This will give you better germination rates as well as longer storage times. Speaking of storage, dry your seeds on some paper towel indoors for about a week. After that, Store in a cool, dark, dry place. Make sure to fully label them for up to three years or more. What a great crop. Know what else is great? Probably the next episode of the Garden Quickie. It's after the midsummer mark and keen gardeners that just can't get enough are already planting their fall crops. Right now is the time to seed our broccolis, cauliflowers, Brussels sprouts, kale, and other fall staples. Don't get me wrong, I love those guys and I'm planting all of them, but what about thinking outside the box? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to the next episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we answer all of your gardening questions. Even the ones you didn't ask. And today's video theme is what else can I plant? When looking beyond traditional crops for fall, we need to find plants with three characteristics. One, they need to sprout fast. Usually this isn't a problem because even though these crops are gonna be grown for fall, they're still being germinated in the heat of summer. And two, like these chives here, which incidentally didn't make it on this list, they need to grow fast and this isn't negotiable. The clock is ticking and we want a viable harvest before the serious cold weather hits. And finally, this one's a bit more flexible in terms of where you live and how fast or hard your winter hits, but the crop should be somewhat cold hardy. Not Antarctic proof, nothing that serious, but a little frost here or there shouldn't doom the crop. Okay, knowing that, I've picked out my top four non-traditional crops that you could be planting this year. As always, work backwards from your first fall frost date to ensure your window of growing time is sufficient for each variety. Crop number one is lettuce. A quick sprouter and grower, no doubt. The beauty of lettuce is that it's also cold tolerant and it comes in a zillion different varieties. And on top of that, it's harvested for the foliage alone, not an expensive, long awaited fruit. Lettuce is most definitely an ideal fall crop. At number two, we have carrots. Even bucket or bag carrots such as this. Notoriously long to sprout in the spring, summer sown carrots sprout up quick and flourish. And by harvesting in the cooler weather of fall means that these dynamite tap roots are crisper, sweeter, and more unbelievable than normal. Third up, we got beets. Similar to carrots, beets only get better as the cooler weather sets in. And they're even more cold hardy with heavy frosts not phasing them one bit. With beets naturally pairing with many of our fall dinners and holiday dishes, definitely don't forget to plant them this summer. And finally, the ultimate spring crop, five months later, comes full circle. That's right, I'm talking peas. Delicious pods packed with flavor. If you like harvesting and eating spring peas, the fall ones are gonna knock your socks off. Fall gardening is often surrounded in mystery, crazy timings, frost dates, and wondering what you can plant. These four non-traditional crops provide a bridge to that unknown so that your autumn endeavors are much more enjoyable. Know what else is enjoyable? The next episode of The Garden Quickie. In a given year, there are two days that are more important to a gardener than any other. And for every gardener, they're different. 
No, I'm not talking about your anniversary or your kids' birthdays. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Right Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or more, we answer the most important gardening questions of the day. And today, we're talking frost dates. What are they? When are they? And why are they so important? TikTok time's wasting, so let's get into it. Frost dates are your two specific annual calendar dates, different for every region, that delineate when there becomes a greater than 50% chance of frost occurring. Hmm. That is, in the spring, the date in which the next day has less than 50% chance of getting a frost. And in the fall, the date in which the cooler weather returns and is the first day where there's a greater than 50% chance of getting that frost. And that right there will be your first fall frost date. So in the spring, it's considered your last day of frost. And in the fall, it's considered your first day of frost. Being weather dependent, obviously, every region has a different set of dates. North Texas is going to be radically different than South Toronto as is Seattle versus Saskatchewan. Unless you're of divine creation, the only way to know these dates is to look them up. Simply type in your location, followed by frost date, on any browser search, and the information will pop up for you. Every single crop we grow is affected by weather and temperature. Some more than others. There's many plants that can live and thrive through a light frost, while there's also many plants that perish in a heavy one. And even if a plant doesn't die outright on a frosty night, the signals to stop producing fruit, or worse, killing the fruit, are just as bad. As much as I'd love to grow peppers and tomatoes for aesthetics, if there were no fruit, I wouldn't be growing them. So these dates are important because they allow us to plan. We can now calculate when to start our spring seeds indoors, or, when we can direct sow our root crops after the long winter. That fall date can let us know if this fruit has enough time to ripen. Or if this quick crop of peas has enough time to flower, set pods, and produce. When I plant every single crop in a given year, it's completely dictated by those two dates. It's not an exact science, however, and quite often the date itself is more of a range than a single day. What I like to do is first figure out the frost date, then watch the weather patterns close to that time frame. Because I've seen snow after the spring date, and I've seen summer weather after the fall one. Just think of those two dates as guiding lights on the way to gardening greatness. Know what else is great? Probably the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.